Welcome to the Being Human UT podcast, where Dr. Randy Jasmine and Dr. Jim Hindigas will discuss issues relative to the humanities and technology at Utah Tech University. And now your hosts for Being Human UT podcast, Dr. Randy Jasmine and Dr. Jim Hindigas. Welcome to the Being Human Utah Tech podcast. We are back for our third season. We've had a great experience up to this point, and we've talked to some great guests. And today, we're going to continue with that. Um, my partner in crime, Jim Hendigus, has arranged this podcast. So, Jim, tell us about our guest for today. I'm going to be really uh, transparent and say that we are all on the same hallway. <laughs> <laughs> and so it wasn't very difficult to arrange this this meetup. Um, but um, we have Susan Ertel here, and Susan is going to retire in the spring. And you're coming all the way to you're you're going all the way to the spring, right? You're not going to give up on us in May 2024. <laughs> and Susan's been teaching for a while, and I was just excited to sort of ask her about. What has teaching been like throughout your life? I mean, we we talk about technology and humanities, but and these are real educators that that evolve with the technology. And so I, I thought this would be a great opportunity to just say, you know, where did you um, begin this experience uh, as a teacher, and and what are some of the things that you've noticed over time as you've changed and the landscapes changed. So um, uh, I, I can't let you introduce yourself. <laughs> um, I, that you'll give a better introduction than I will. But I mean, my first real question is: I mean, how was education like when you started, um, both um, in, in K through twelve and in, in higher ed? So, as a student, um, K through twelve was all you know, well. K through graduate school was all still pre-digital. So when I did my master's thesis, it was still, you go to the library, you search through the card catalog, you have to find a physical book to find a source. Um, and then, you know, you type your paper on a typewriter and hope you don't make any mistakes because then you would have to type over. And, and um, so that was, you know, graduate school, we were still using typewriters. I, I tell the story to my students, my boyfriend in grad school got the first personal computer on campus in his dorm room and people would knock on the door like can you turn it on for me because they wanted to just see it come on and it was a little bitty you know apple computer with maybe a five inch screen with the black screen with the green letters on it it was so ancient but that was that was cutting edge in you know 86 87 so uh, the first year I started teaching high school was 87 and my high school that I taught in still had a mimeograph machine so you could take the documents through and it would put this lovely kind of pale purple ink on the document and you would print how many ever copies you needed and the first thing the students did was was huff the paper because it had this weird kind of <laughs> um you know hallucinogenic um, smell to it and and they would love that but we had um you know, overhead projectors where you laid the transparency on and it projected on the screen and you wrote with, a, you know, kind of a, a water-based marker that you could wipe off. We had opaque projectors where if you needed to, to show them a page in a book, you would slide your paper into this giant thing that's probably as big as three or four Instapots put together. And, you know, you had to lug them around from room to room on a cart. Um, my... And this sounds, you know, we're waxing poetic here. My, my multimedia class for my teacher ed prep, um, we learned how to film. We, we learned how to thread um, film projectors so that we could watch longer movies. Um, students had these little personal projector things that had a cassette tape and a little cartridge with a film in it and you threaded the film in put the cassette in and they were synchronized together so every time you got to a new slide the the tape would go ding yep. and then you had to advance the film yep. um, so we were still using those so that was you know pretty much high school and middle school and then I taught K through 12 so and that was in 88 so that was still definitely pre-digital um, you had to have 
you had to have paper for everything. Students had to have pens and pencils. There was no laptop. There was no computer lab for them to work in. And so I started teaching college in 89. And so for a few sweet years, (laughs) there was no internet. And then all of a sudden the internet was here and things were getting different. So I have pre-internet stories and post-internet stories. So, Well, do you, you know, one of the first questions that I have is that when you had um, uh, technology, I mean, it wasn't that it was not significant when you were hauling around this machinery, Mm -hmm. but it just didn't seem like it was at the forefront or if it was integral. I mean, there's this part of me that says, did you feel like you couldn't have class if one of those things weren't working? Because it feels like right now, if Canvas is not working, I just like, will everybody just go home? (laughs) Yeah, we, we panic now because the technology is so ubiquitous. I mean, we, you know, movie day pre pre internet if you had movie day at school if a student saw the av cart coming down the hall toward their classroom it was like yeah movie day because it was so different because mm-hmm. it was pretty much you know stand and deliver kind of education you were you were doing lectures the students were doing worksheets worksheets they were in small groups you didn't have this okay everybody log on to your laptop and polish your draft it was it was all handwritten papers with handwritten comments and marks back to them. So it was, it was really different. Um, and you almost always, depending on your school district, you almost always anticipated that the machinery would not work. So you did have a plan B because the film wouldn't thread correctly. The VHS wouldn't advance or something would work. Something would fall apart. Um, so you always had a paper alternative. I always have an emergency folder that I I still carry everywhere that's like, because last week we had the internet for 25 minutes would yep. not work in a 50 minute class. So it's like, what do we do? We can send them home <laughs> or. <laughs> yeah. And I had mentioned that to you, just a, a, a humorous, uh, you know, little moment that happened as a result of that. Um, I really had to show my class how to create the references page entry for text that they were working with. And so during that 20 minutes that the internet was down, I said, well, let's just do this the old fashioned way. And so I I wrote it on the board and my handwriting is terrible when I have to write in that kind of free form element. So that was a problem. But when I got to the title of the book, you know, I did the angle brackets around Mm -hmm. it. And so as I was describing it to my students, I said, well, these angle brackets, um, or what you do when you're writing by hand to denote italics. And of course, by the time I had gotten done writing it on the board, the internet was back up. But since I had put that effort in, I I showed them anyway. Well, (laughs) this week I was reading through the rough drafts of that class and one student in her um, printed out, typed up references page, typed in angle brackets instead of making the title of the book italics. I said, that only applies when you're writing it out by hand. So again, that concept of, she probably thought, well, what does that mean? When would I ever write anything out by hand? He must mean angle brackets. And just to kind of insert here, um, I was a student and, you know, started my, my teaching career maybe a decade or so later than you. And, you know, one of the things that I always try to make a distinction between, and I think that our conversation can, you know, benefit from is that there are a couple of things that undoubtedly, undoubtedly without question, helped us as instructors and helped students. You talk about the typewriter, let's hope we don't make mistakes. You know, my father, he doesn't say this so much anymore, but he likes to be the nostalgic guy. And he's like, oh gosh, I liked it when you typed it out on a typewriter. And I said, no invention Mm -hmm. for my life was better, more important than the word processor. Mm -hmm. Our lives and our students' lives have been unbelievably improved by the word processor. And the second one you and I were talking about earlier this week, the fact that, you know, projecting material onto the board where we don't have to do the labor intensive, create overhead slide, create 20 overhead slides to have for the class that we can have a computer screen Mm -hmm. that gets projected in front of our students so that we're talking to them and we're reinforcing what we're talking about with what they can see as well. Pedagogically, that's a, a, a very important um, step for us and helps us to be better teachers and helps them to learn more. 
then we get into gray areas Mm -hmm. where there is plenty of technology. And one of the questions I have that I was looking at some sites where is it a toy or a tool? You know, we have Mm -hmm. to ask that question. The latest technology, is it a toy or a tool? Mm -hmm. And how can we see if it really helps? So, you know, I always think about what are the things that are really helping me? What are the things that are really helping my students? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. That, that, uh, that's something I think that we're going to have to continue mm-hmm. to think about. Well, what, I, what I've noticed is once students got into that kind of digital world, there, there's an egalitarianism to access to information. So if I show a PowerPoint to students in class now, I've got it on Canvas. They can download it. They can look at it anytime that I want. Where before, if I brought in 20 transparencies to put on the overhead, (laughs) they were mine. They were always mine. They went back to my office and students had to really scramble to try to (laughs) write down that information. But now that information is more readily available. Um, You know, I have always, my whole career has been working with underprepared students. So the word processor is is life-saving for some students that that we have students with dysgraphia. We have students with dyslexia. We have students who don't read well, you know, Microsoft word. If you, if you highlight a section and ask it to read it out loud, it will read it out loud to you. If you're not a good reader, that's, that's a game changer because you can hear it through another voice. You can learn how to pronounce words you've never heard before. It's just the technology that helps with learning disabilities and learning accommodations is just mind blowing from where it used to be. You know, we, we used to have to hire someone to sit in a room like this and read a textbook onto cassettes right. to give to a blind student or to give to a student who was visually impaired or a student who had dyslexia. And that that was labor intensive. It it would take nine, ten, twelve hours to read a textbook. And then if it was a math textbook, the, the labor involved in trying to read math problems for a blind student or for a visually impaired student, it was, it was just so cost prohibitive. Um, but, but now, you know, the, the robots can do that for us. Right. So it's good. <laughs> so you, when did you start and oh, actually, when did you start here and what was it called? <laughs> I started teaching here in January of 1999 and it was Dixie college. Okay, it was, it was a two college. year community yeah. college with about 3,000 students. Mm-hmm. So so Utah Tech University was my fifth name change. Okay. Fifth, yeah. mis- fourth mission change and fifth mm-hmm. name change. I got here at Dixie State College of Utah and I didn't know when that. 2001. 2001, 2001. okay. Just okay. before, it just, okay. I got here in 04 and it had just changed. Right. So there were five. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that change to Dixie State College of Utah was accompanied with the first bachelor's programs. Okay. There were five bachelor's programs when I got here, but then mm-hmm. that's when we really started under, under the, when, when Donna Dillingham Evans was provost, we really started to rapidly add mm-hmm. um, four year programs. Mm-hmm. And in fact, right. um, I started in the fall of 04 and by the fall of 06, we had a four year degree in English. Yep. Why well, did you, when you started here, mm-hmm. I mean, what were the educational priorities? And I, I'm, it's kind of tied with educational priorities in the student body that you were working with. And have you, how have you seen it sort of shift those priorities? We were a transfer machine. We, mm-hmm. our job was to get mostly local students um, from their high school to their associate's degree and get them out to a university. So we, and we still were merged with the technical college at that point. So we had an applied technology section that was still doing all the mechanics classes, all the HVAC, all the electrician, um, all that kind of stuff was still merged with us. So we were doing, you know, just the, the yeoman's work of, of hard, hard tasks to get people certified for, um, professional credentials and then to get them to their associate's degree and then to get them on to a university. So we, we never kept anybody more than three years. Yeah. We used to have those first couple of years, um, like we have, you know, club rush day where all the tables are out, um, you know, in front of the McDonald building in the student center with the clubs, we used to have transfer day mm-hmm. and all the Utah uh-huh. and area colleges mm-hmm. would set up their tables and students would, well, where am I transferring to? Because I can't get my four year degree here. And, um, 
Yeah. Like a, like a high school, like with all the colleges yes. coming yeah, in. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It was like our grad fair, but for bachelor's mm-hmm. degrees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was, it was interesting. Mm-hmm. So. No, I mean, it, it is interesting. I mean, my experience getting here in, in 2010, um, is that, I mean, I could s- still kind of smell the community college mm-hmm. on, mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. this institution, yeah. but it was also like, there's, there's so much aspiration and now, I mean, <laughs> well, we are, we are a dual mission mm-hmm. college and, and what we do as a dual mission university is that we do recognize that we, we have a population that only needs an associate's degree for career advancement or, you know, personal satisfaction or whatever. And, and our job is to try to encourage them to think beyond that, to aspire to a bachelor's degree, but we still, we still grant a whole lot of associates degrees. So it's, it's our, it's our mission because we are geographically, you know, the next closest community college is snow. Um, and then the next closest one is Salt Lake. And, you know, we, we have to serve this geographic region. So I mean, that's what I, I wonder is that we've changed, but I mean, have we really changed that much? I mean, we're, we're almost, we changed a lot, yeah. you know, and what's funny to me is that, I mean, I, and you're in these conversations where, you know, we want to keep our students for a lot of people want to keep our students for the full four years. And they're kind of like, don't transfer, don't transfer, which is kind of funny when, when the history was please transfer, tra- transfer, please transfer. Yeah. And so I just always kind of wonder like what, what, how have students changed, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm guessing they've changed through the technology as well. I mean, their expectation of what a course looks like without, I mean, it's, it's actually, it's, it's tied to technology. I mean, there's no way they, I mean, at this point they, they have to open up a computer to take a course. You exactly. can't do that, you know, different. Yeah. Yeah, they do. It, and, and that is, that level of expectation harms them sometimes when you've got a class that's like a performance class or a studio class in art where where they're not on a computer and they're like well where's the where's the where's the youtube video that i watch before i do this and like no watch me <laughs> watch the instructor and then you know you'll i'll model then you'll perform and they they think that everything has to be Googled first before they can see it as real, you know. Interesting. Um, yeah, and that, you know, kind of takes me to, I, I, I earlier mentioned two things that I think help both the teacher and the student, but I think that, you know, we even work with, in my 2010 class, an article, and I may change it to a more recent one, but this article basically um, lays out research that was done saying, if you take the small reward of giving into temptation and looking at your phone or your laptop for non-class related material, the the research shows you're going to perform worse in the class. Mm -hmm. And so students, human beings are going to be so tempted, even the best students who have that laptop, I feel like the laptop has become the the guy, the cowboy with the white hat, whereas the phone is the cowboy with the black hat. If you have a laptop open, you look like you're doing something class related, but you could be doing just about anything. And so the temptation is there. The expectation to use that technology is there. And yet even students themselves admit, I'm tempted to to check my Facebook page. I'm tempted to, you know, shop. I'm tempted to watch a sports video. We know the data shows us that they'll perform worse Unless, you know, it, you know, we could have the draconian, you know, cell phone box policy. Mm-hmm. But then again, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in my composition classes, have students creating short pieces of writing, creating paraphrases in class. Um, so we've gone down this road of saying, we're going to put that temptation in front of you. We know some of you are going to take it. How do you try to balance that in your class? Do you monitor yeah. it really closely? Do you, you know, give them, you know, s- short assignments with, you know, reporting expectations that makes it so that they have to spend most of their time at least working on something class related? Right. So uh, uh, 
I probably created part of this monster too because I wrote a digital textbook. So to access the textbook, right, students right. have to go yes. onto their laptop or to their phone. They have to log into Canvas and get the textbook. But often, and and they self police. I've I've noticed this the last couple of semesters. The students will ask, "Do I need my laptop today?" Mm. And and I don't know if it's a, a selfish thing where they're trying to conserve battery. <laughs> I mean, because our tables are wired, they could plug it in. But they have they have started making better decisions about: Do I really need my laptop out? Are you going to project it on the on the board? If you're going to do that, then I don't need my laptop out. And then I, I try to do lots of activities where, and and we do it kind of like. Uh, you know, the, the millionaire quiz show that I tell them they, they can work quietly for a couple of minutes on a quiz. Then they can phone a friend, which is, they can ask a neighbor, well, what'd you get on that one? And, you know, and, and I tell them, hold your ground. Don't change your answer just because your friend has something different. Hold your ground. Let's talk about it. But then they can call in an expert, and I'm the expert. So if everybody's stumped, then they can ask me. Nice. And we do that whole activity with no computer. Um, they're, they've got a piece of paper in front of them. They've got a pen or a pencil. They're talking to each other. They are collaborating, trying to learn something. Um, and then they can ask me if they get completely stopped. And I, I, I joke with them that I'm not the Google but I'm pretty darn close <laughs> Be, because I have a pub quiz kind of brain. Sure. Stuff goes in and nothing comes out. I mean, nothing gets lost. It's all in there. So we we can do those kind of activities. But I've, I've noticed more and more, especially since COVID, students are like, do I really need my computer out today? You know, they don't even take it out of their backpack some. Um but it, it's it's interesting. I I stopped fighting the phone thing a long time ago, and I will just I'll just ask them something in class, and if nobody answers, I'm like, well, just use the internet. You've got you've got more computing power in your hand than the first you know eight or nine NASA missions combined. So yeah, yeah. just ask the internet what it says. Yeah. You know, that's great. And I think that that's kind of a, a way that we've had to evolve. I, I don't fight that fight anymore. And what I do is what I just kind of said to you is I, every class, to, to whatever the class is early on, we have this discussion and sometimes I'll even bring in, you know, quotes or, or, um, infographics from this research about you'll do, po you'll do poorly. Um, you'll do worse if you check your phone all the time, if you check your laptop all the time. Um, please, you know, I agree with you. I mean, you know, most of my students now have the text online. Mm -hmm. So um, I let them know you're going to hurt yourself if that's what you do. And does that stop all of them from accessing non-class related material? No, of course not. But the best students kind of, I think, rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. And then I, I really like that collaborative element that you bring into that writing too. So, you know, um, um, one of the questions, I, I looked online at some questions about centers for teaching and learning that tend to be entities that really promote a lot of the best new educational technology. And I just, you know, was trying to find what are the kinds of questions that they ask. And, you know, one of the things that I really liked was, does this piece of technology um, prevent great analog thinking and learning. And it sounds like some of the things that you do, and I've gone to, you you know, you, you and I have discussed this, I've gone to far more in-class pen and paper assignments. Right. And, you know, we have those analog learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you talked about earlier, is it a toy or a tool? I'm going to add a third. Is it a crutch? Yeah. That yeah. if you are, you know, you know good teaching when you see it. And is good teaching enhanced by effective technology? Yes. Is poor teaching going to get better with technology added on? Probably not. There, there, are, there are teaching skills and there are people skills and there are classroom management skills that can't be remediated with technology. Right. So the more bells and whistles you have, the more fancy, shiny programs that are out there for us to dip into as educators are not going to fix the core problems of 
not speaking clearly, not writing instructions that are effective, not being organized in a manner that makes students have less anxiety about what's coming in the semester. Those are things that are learned over time by modeling and watching, you know, great teachers. And if if you just think adding more technology is going to make you a better teacher without doing the hard work up front, it's not. Um, I just finished reading a book called Deep Work. Um, I think the writer's name is Newton. And he talks about the, the example he gives at the front of the book is that Jung went away and built a house out in the woods away from everyone else so that he could get away from Freud's influence. He could get away from his patients and he could just think for a month at a time. Jeff Bezos does the exact same thing. He, he takes off for a month at a time, goes to a place where there is no internet, no phone, no internet, Out, no outer TV. Space, is that where he goes? Well, he do, maybe he does <laughs> in his... Say, in does, his doesn't Aaron Rodgers do the same thing? No, yes. but I think there's internet in outer space. Oh, but yeah. he, he takes these, you know, and Phil and I joke at home, we call them Amish weekends. We just unplug sometimes and we don't look at our devices. We don't look at the phone. We don't look at the computer. We don't consume any like news or media on the internet. And, and it's just a reset where it's completely analog and we have long conversations. We sit down and read a book for more than an hour. And it's, I think we're missing some of that. If if everything is shallow work, if everything is immediacy, you respond to every email as soon as it dings into your computer, then you're letting someone else dictate how your day manifests. I, I love it when I see emails from colleagues that say, I check my email between 8 and 9 a.m. and between 3 and 4 p.m. And that's when I'm going to check my email. And it's like, great, set a boundary. Tell me that this is when I can reach you. You know, I encourage new faculty. It's like, don't take stuff home. You know, have a hard line that says work stops here and my life starts there. And it, it's hard to do especially when you're new and you're creating all kinds of new prep and stuff for courses. But if, I mean, we could work ourselves to death, literally, if if we don't set some boundaries. And technology means that my boss can reach me 24-7. Yeah. But it he shouldn't me, be able to do that because he doesn't pay me 24-7, <laughs> right? <laughs> it took me 12 years to figure that out for myself that, mm -hmm. like, oh, I don't need an answer, an email at, at 2 p.m. on Saturday. No. Um, and I just, I thought in my mind, oh, well, you know, just especially when Canvas is on my phone, mm -hmm. it's such a, it's a mixed bag on the one hand. Canvas it, is not on my phone. Oh, that's so good. I, I, mm -hmm. It's, it's been great to solve a problem really quickly, but in some ways I've always questioned, was this really a problem or somebody else's urgency? Well, <laughs> when you get an alert, everything's a fire, right? Mm -hmm. And you feel like you have to respond to it. And I just, I just don't do it. I mean, we, we have a colleague, um, who's notorious for sending emails at two and 3 AM. And it's like, <laughs> you're talking about me. What are you doing? It's like, go to bed already. You know? And, and I just think that's your life. You've chosen mm -hmm. that. I can only control my mm -hmm. responses and no one has ever died because I didn't respond to an email immediately. Right. We're not in the medical profession. They're that's not good. in the medical <laughs> profession. And, and I think sometimes we get caught up in, in, I want to be a good employee. I want to be responsive. But again, we're allowing other people to dictate how how we do our work best. Yeah, and and, and that's easy to encroach into your life. And I think that it also, um, you know, bleeds over into um, pedagogy and the te and the student experience. You know. Um, We've gone through various trainings about, particularly about online teaching, but I think it applies to face-to-face -face teaching as well, that, you know, that encroachment of the email, the contact, even if you don't give out any information other than what you should give out, right, your, your, your email, mm -hmm. um, what happens when that one comes at 1158? You know, what are the kinds of expectations that are there? It comes at two o'clock in the afternoon. And I remember reading or even watching a video from an educator training saying, you know, don't, don't, you know, get that stuff back to your students as quickly as you can. They want feedback right away. And I think if I think about my experience with my students, 
Um, there are students who want to grade right away. They want to know exactly what they got, and that's the last they'll think about that assignment. But I think the ones who really do want feedback from me are willing to say, hey, feedback, particularly if you've got a class of you know 35 students, feedback can't be instantaneous for everyone. And that just like them... I need to do some deep thinking, not just about what I'm going to say, you know, the longer my feedback, the better. I don't mean that. What's going to be the best way for me to address what I have to address in the feedback that I'm giving them. So this immediacy that's being pushed in some quarters and this, you know, be available to your students at all times. I remember hearing, you know, when I first got here that an online teacher, you know, was notorious for responding to emails within, you know, 15 minutes of getting them. And I'm like, well, what about at night? And what about on weekend? Oh, all the time. And I thought how easy it would become for people to then hold that up as a standard because it mm -hmm. seems to be, yeah. you know, a good thing, but I'm, like, like both of you have been saying, I'm, I'm just not sure, both for our sanity, but also for the value of what we give to our students, that may not be the best thing to do. Well, the immediate response is not always the best response. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and we've all heard the caution, um, you know, through, through HR training and through all the stuff that, that, you know, sometimes you write the email <laughs> and then you leave it for 24 hours and then you decide whether you want to send the email or not, particularly if it's a hotter issue or something, but that why not, why not control that for a lot of our communication that, that does this require an immediate response? If it doesn't, then I'm, I'm not going to feel obligated just because a timer dinged or a, or a notification dropped that I have to immediately respond to that. Um, we, we are not surgeons. We're not in the medical profession. It, we're not, we're not firefighters. We're not firefighters. Mm -hmm. We, but we've trained ourselves through technology to always respond to the alerts as if we are in a life or death kind of situation. And, and it, you know, we feel, we, I feel sometimes that our integrity or our, or our work ethic or whatever might be called into question if we don't respond quickly and and like I I don't know I gave up worrying about what people think about me a long time ago <laughs> but and but then, there was that desire to always you know like be on top and be the first one to respond and it's like no I just I don't that's not where my good thinking happens I, I've told my students that you know I'm a human being um, I am trying to stick as closely to the rubric as possible but I get cranky mm -hmm. like if I have four papers in a row that frustrate me if you're the fifth paper <laughs> you want me to stop grading exactly. and you want me to grade tomorrow you're like trust me because i have done that before and it's kind of been embarrassing where i'll go back to a paper and go you know i i don't know why i gave you a c this is kind of closer to a b it might even be an a minus yeah but i i was in a bad i was hangry I yeah was i was hangry place. i was yeah. so you mm -hmm. you waiting an extra 24 hours is actually to your advantage and uh, because, I mean, I try to be as, as fair as possible, but also, I mean, that you're right. The, the immediate reaction is, <laughs> is not always the, the correct. I always yeah. tell my students, you'll get feedback on this assignment before the next assignment is due. Mm -hmm. and, and that varies. You know, sometimes that's the next day if it's a peer review and then we're doing a draft the next day in class. But, you know, it, it gives them... Uh, it gives them a parameter that they can understand. So if they turn something in on Thursday and the next iteration of, is due the next Thursday, they'll get feedback Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, and I tend to, if you turn things in early, I tend to grade them early. If you turn things in late, you get caught up in the last sweep before the final assignments are due. So I don't know. Can I'm you to train them. Can Go you ahead. think of something, I mean, what would you say, and this could be, um, pedagogically based, this could be, you know, sort of um, practically based. What would you say if you think about yourself, even even just going back to, you know, 1999, what would you say is the biggest difference in the way you teach a class today than you did, you know, 24 years ago? I look at my students a lot more now <laughs> because... Um, I used to write everything on the board 
I mean, I, I would fill, if you gave me five whiteboards, I would fill five whiteboards in a class period because I would write everything on the board. So I spent a lot of time talking over my shoulder, ah. kind of half looking at the students with my, my back to half the classroom writing on the board. And, and what I've noticed now that I can project more, I can, I can write on things and annotate things that I have on the board, but I'm writing so much less on the board that I'm facing my students more. I'm, I'm watching their eyes. I'm watching to see if they're understanding. I'm seeing the light bulbs go on. I'm watching the student whose brow furrows and like their brain hurts and I need to figure out why their brain hurts in this lesson. But that's been a big shift that it's changed physically the way I look at my classroom because I used to spend a lot of my time with my back to them writing on the board. I have really good handwriting, but it was, I mean, I would fill up whiteboards or chalkboards when I first started yeah, teaching. Chalk, it was chalkboards. Yeah, I, t I taught on chalkboards. Oh, that's that's mm -hmm. great. And I think that, you know, we can think about how that improves. You know, for me, uh, it wasn't just that, but it was the fear. My handwriting is terrible, but also you're an English teacher and I would live in the fear of misspelling the word. <laughs> Always. And, you know, worry about what happens to my authority in the classroom mm -hmm. if I misspell a word. And so, you know, having that, the time to prepare it ahead of time, I don't um, have to have that, that worry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just think as you were talking, I just thought about how I instruct my students to do their end of the semester presentations. I say have, it doesn't have to be PowerPoint, but have that visual there. Mm -hmm. don't, don't read it word for word, mm -hmm. you know, refer to it for talking points, but spend time turning your head mostly to them. You know, I always bring in a little remote that they can use to, to advance the slides and talk to us. And, you know, technology has allowed us to do that in a way that, you know, we just couldn't before. And, you know, I'm, I'm big about that kind of they're hearing and they're seeing at the same time. You know, I, we're going through, if we're going over a passage in a work of literature, right. even though all of the students have the text, either hard copy or digital copy in front of them, I will either have it on the board because I prepared it ahead of time, or if it's, you know, not protected by copyright and there's a Project Gutenberg version, I have that passage there. And as I'm reading it, I'm pointing to the key words that I'm emphasizing as I'm reading, and I just feel as though that's a more productive way to teach right. and technology, large T technology has allowed me to, to do that. Right. Showing them how to annotate a text yeah. is huge. And, and like you say, you can project it on the board and, you know, I use lots of different colors of markers too. So I can show them, you know, transition words are in blue. Look how this writer is leading you from point to point. Look, look at how this piece would diminish if we took all those blue words out, you know, so there, it's just, I don't know. It's made it a lot easier, mm -hmm. I think. So are there any technologies that you feel like made you a worse teacher or, and I'm guessing you probably don't use them anymore if you've identified them. <laughs> I tried a lot of things. I, I don't know. I can't say that there's any one thing that made me worse because if it made me uncomfortable and I didn't like how I interacted with it, I wasn't going to impose that on my students. So I, I stick to like, you know, we, we have PowerPoint. We project stuff from the little document camera and um, we do some audio stuff. Um, we'll watch, you know, when I teach, um, like paraphrasing and summarizing and responding, we'll watch a TED Talk. They'll turn to each other, try to summarize the main point. Um, I'll, I'll play a particularly poignant pas passage or a profound passage, and then they'll try to paraphrase it, put it in their own words, and then they'll write a response to it. So using readily available pre you know pre-managed content like that that I can preview bring into the class it models good behavior because all of the TED talk speakers are using teleprompters they're not looking at their slides if they have slides the slides are just there to entertain the audience they're not there to promote the message the the messenger is promoting the message so you know I every once in a while um you can see where a class just does not engage with a video. And I think that's where I've made better decisions where it's like, uh, is, 
is a video is a 15 minute video too long for this activity what if there's a shorter one what if what if we can do some different things but i don't know this is off topic but i'll I'll say you know this is a, a thing that goes around in my mind has there become the thought in people's mind if someone comes out well dressed with the McDonald's drive through headphone on, headset on, and they talk like they know something. They talk like they, um, they talk in TED Talk mm-hmm. cadence and TED Talk diction that immediately there's an authority. Well, have we, have, we, oh, have yeah. we invested some people with maybe a false authority because of that has become the performative way that TED Talks are presented? Definitely. Um, well, and you think about... You know, the old definition of an expert was somebody 50 miles away from home with a briefcase that, you know, that in your own hometown, people might dismiss you. But if you go 50 miles away with a briefcase, all of a sudden you're an expert on this topic. And there is that kind of TED Talk aura that if someone comes out in that kind of presentation mode, you're like, oh, they're authoritative. I should listen to them. But but, you know. We teach as English teachers the crap test. You know, is it credible? Right. <laughs> is it reliable? Right. Is it repeatable? You know, is it authentic? Is it accurate? You know, so I'm always going through those things in my head. It's like, mm, just because they're dressed like this doesn't mm-hmm. mean that I should, you know, invest in their product right. or right. wholesale listen to them. Or, I mean, we've watched how, we've watched how, you know, multi level marketing scams and all that stuff have kind of, um, perpetuated that, well, this person's standing in front of a screen and they are dressed, you know, they're dressed well and they're, they're talking like they know what they're, they're doing and I'm going to give them all my money. It's like, no, mm-hmm. yeah. don't it, give them all your yeah, money. It, it's, it's not new to Ted talk. No. It's just one of the most recent manifestations, right. you know, the, the snake oil concept. Yeah. The, well, uh, yeah. How, to, how, to, how to win friends and influence people. Yes. I mean, well, you go back to the music man. I mean, literally yeah, a yeah. fast talking, well-dressed man comes to town and says, I'm going to, I'm going to give your town a band. Give me your money. Mm-hmm. And they believe him. But now the music man can come to every town the in music the world man can be on simultaneously. Your phone. Yeah, yeah, he can be on your phone in 20 seconds. It's like, it's crazy. And I think that's, that may be like the biggest problem with technology is that where we used to get information like from a garden hose in the yard mm. in a manageable amount, it's now it's not even a fire hose. It's like the dam has burst and there's just all of this information. And and if you feel flooded by information all the time, you're less likely to make good decisions about whether it's good information faulty information, bad information, misleading information. I think I think we have to do better at teaching younger and younger students how to recognize, um, you know, digitally enhanced photographs, um, how to recognize um, augmented voice messages and things where, you know, we're seeing scams all the time with grandparents getting automated phone calls from a grandkid, you know, who's in grandma, I'm in jail. I need $5,000. And it's a scam because somebody has sampled voices and created a plausible message that a savvy media consumer would recognize as fake, but not all of our students are savvy media consumers. We know they're not. So. You, you have a wealth of knowledge as an educator, and we could talk for hours, but mm-hmm. I want to make sure I get to this one question, which Good. is now that you have taught for this long. Um, 36 years. 36 <laughs> years. Like what is your, what are some key pieces of advice that you, you give? I mean, you said that you, you do give advice to new teachers. I mean, what, what are some key pieces of advice with your knowledge now and also seeing how education has evolved? Um. One, one thing that I try to tell um, new faculty is, is you have to decide what's best for your teaching style, that, that there are centers on campus, there are trainings, there are, there are trainings at conferences that will try to say, this is the way. Well, that's the way for that person who's presenting, or that's the way for that teaching style. You have to be confident enough in your 
personal teaching style to know what works and what doesn't work for you. Because what works for me in the classroom probably won't work for Randy. You know, what works for you in the classroom won't work for me. But sometimes we're all forced to fit into one thing because the state's made an investment in this technology or the (laughs) university's made an investment in this technology. And it's like, just because the technology is on the shelf in the supermarket doesn't mean I have to be a consumer of that. And I think for younger faculty in particular, there's a pressure to fit in and to just adopt things because it looks like everyone around you is adopting it. And I would just say, stand firm in your confidence that you know best how you teach and don't, don't become a less effective teacher just to use a technology that everybody else is using. Well, and it's funny. I mean, I think I remember as a junior faculty, or is that is that what we call? Yeah, that's what I call them. <laughs> um, <laughs> Makes me senior faculty. Like, so. I, I saw those people, kind of like me now, that are like, oh, well, they're just like breaking the rules, or they're not. They're they're being rebellious. They're being difficult. And now being in that position, I almost feel like no, like actually. They're trying to model that you need to have some autonomy. You need to have some of your own it, because it, it is a, a, an earth shattering moment when you realize, oh, I can be the teacher that I am as opposed to being the teacher that you are right? and, and, and or this, you know, here's the model teacher. This is what you be like this person. And you're like, well. I, I'm not even that, I'm, I wouldn't be good at being a teacher like you. Yeah. <laughs> I can well, be good at be a teacher like me. You know, my teacher, you know, my teachers that I modeled after, you know, to serve with love, Sidney Poitier, that, <laughs> that movie changed my life. And it's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to work with underprepared students. I'm going to get them out of the ghettos and into, you know, whatever. I'm not Sidney Poitier. I'm not, you know, I'm not that teacher. I can't do that. And, you know, and then you watch like the prime of Miss Jean Brody. And then you, then you watch. <laughs> That's what um, I thought you were going to say dead poet society. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, that. we're going, I'm older than you remember. So what I was have, the, I have seen all of these movies. You mentioned. Goodbye, students. Mr. Chips, Goodbye, you know, Mr. Chips, and then, yeah. and then there was welcome back Cotter. And then, and you know, and then you had stand and deliver. You had all of this stuff that happened before dead poet society. And a lot of people use Robin Williams, um, character in Dead Poet Society is kind of the moment they were like, "Yeah, I'm going to be that teacher." I am not climbing on a desk. I would get <laughs> hurt. Out pages I would of get hurt. <laughs> I would be more like Peter O'Toole in Goodbye, Mr. Chips. I would be staid and calm. I was say and that yeah, there's you know at least three versions of Goodbye, Mr. Chips no, that I'm familiar with. Peter this, O'Toole. Um, it's the it's Martin the good Clunes one. Martin Clunes did one in the early 2000s. Yeah. Talking 60s. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm <laughs> familiar with that, too. You know, if you can make you can, if you can make teaching Latin seem exciting, then you're a good teacher. Yeah, right? You're a yeah. good teacher. But, <laughs> you know, and, I, and I've, I've read this a couple of times. Um, we are one of the only professions where it is entirely plausible that in 10 years, there'll be a knock on our office door and it'll be a student that we taught and they'll just say, I just wanted to thank you. You turned my life around. You changed my experiences. Nobody else really gets that. And I'm at the point where I have literally taught a grandchild of a former student. And, and that, that doesn't happen in any other profession. Not a single student of mine has ever said, wow, you know that PowerPoint you did on commas? I love it. (laughs) It's the human part of what I do that they remember. The technology is a vehicle. It's not the driver. Mm -hmm. I'm the driver. And I think we have to keep going back to that, that it's every interaction we have with students in class is a personal human experience. The technology is just there to facilitate that and not drive it. That's that's very well stated. Very well stated. Well, this has been a great conversation. Um, we're very thankful to um, English professor Susan Ertel, soon to be retired emeritus English professor Susan Ertel, um, for her insights. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we will be back next month with another installment of Being Human Utah Tech. Until next time, so long. This has been the Being Human UT podcast with Dr. Randy Jasmine and Dr. Jim Hindigas. Please follow and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. From Utah Tech University, this is the Being Human UT podcast.